Hello, everybody. It's great to be here, to be back. Uh, the last time I was here, and the first time was in 2019, I was interviewing other speakers. And now I'm a speaker myself. That's great. And uh, yeah, Ricardo, great speech. Thank you very much. I am completely agree with uh, your um, um, the last things you said about uh, grassroots adoption. So yeah, I want to... Nonetheless, I want to introduce myself. My name is Anita Posch. I'm the author of uh, this book, Learn Bitcoin. I still have got some copies downstairs, and I can also sign it for you if you're interested. And um, I'm also the founder of Bitcoin for Fairness, which is a nonprofit initiative uh, whose goal it is to foster grassroots adoption on the ground in the global south, because that's where I think Bitcoin is needed the most. And I'm, we, are, I'm, we are doing this also um, by sharing knowledge. So I'm not going here to tell them, oh, I'm the white person. I'm telling you now how this works. I'm going there, sharing my knowledge with them on one level to then help them to set up their own structures and their own communities. So that's a picture of Bitcoin Ekasi in South Africa, a circular economy and the senior guide here, Lufando, on my side, he has now set up the first Raspi Blitz that I brought when I was there. And the first channels are open, so look out for Bitcoin Ekasi and open some channels. Yeah, um, pack your bags, let's go home. Um, Bitcoin is useless. That's what the mainstream media is telling us, or many so-called technologists. Um, it uses too much energy, we don't need it, and I'm here to tell you the opposite. I think Bitcoin is the embodiment of human rights. And for some maybe anarchists, anarchist, libertarian, Bitcoiners, um, the United Nations is not the right organization, but I think in general, the Declaration of Human Rights is a good document for a sort of a, let's say, moral, ethical uh, standard for all people in the world. But first, let's take a look at the state of the world. Why do we need Bitcoin? 45% of the global population live in authoritarian regimes. They don't have full democracies. Actually, only 6.4% people live in countries like Germany, um, France, whatever, yeah, in, in Europe and in the US, which are full democracies. All the others are either flawed democracies or they are really full dictatorships or authoritarian regimes. If we take a look at a map of this democracy index, you can see a, a sort of um, pattern, you know. We start on the right-hand side, Russia, China, over um, Africa and going into South Africa. The dark red are the countries where life is the worst, in a way, for people. They have the least freedom there. And the top country in that sense is Afghanistan, Myanmar, North Korea, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Syria, and Central African Republic. If we take a look at the map of public corruption, we see the same pattern. So there seems to be some sort of uh, correlation between um, corruption and democracy. And then I have the world wealth map and we see the same pattern. So in countries with dictators and authoritarian leaders, it seems uh, where democracy is not that good, it seems that people are poorer. And the poorest countries are in Africa and uh, the Middle East. So there, I guess, are so many reasons for that that I can't explain. But I think that one of the reasons definitely has been colonialism. And this was also the reason why the British pound basically was the first uh, so the British was the first monetary hegemon they had basically the the global um, monetary power because everyone was always if they were doing trade or something like that they were counting in British sterling and the uh, British pound still was pegged to gold but after the First World War, their power deteriorated. And after the Second World War, we all know the US Americans were the winner of, winners of the Second World War. And many European countries sent all their gold to the US 
to um, not be stolen from the by the Nazis. And so the US had basically all the gold in the world and they were the winners of the war. And so they had the power to say, like in 1944, it was decided in Bretton Woods that the US dollar is now the global reserve currency and all other currencies are exchanged uh, to the US dollars in exchange, have an exchange rate. And this was still on the gold standard. So it was really backed to, to something that was something worth where energy was in, put in. And in 1971, after the, in the 60s, the, the power of the US also deteriorated, Vietnam War and all these kinds of things. And also the, the economies, the growing economies needed more money in a way than there was that was packed to gold. So uh, Richard Nixon abolished the gold standard in 1971 and basically rendered all currencies in the world, because they were all exchanged to the US dollar, to fiat money. And fiat is Latin and means let it be done. So basically, our money is on, has only value because it's legal tender, because the nation state tells it, us to use it. And so that way. The, the US knew they will be running into a problem and in 1974 they reached an agreement with Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC states that oil may only be sold for US dollars. And that's what we call today the petrodollar, which is basically backed by war. Because the US Americans guaranteed the OPEC countries military protection for them to only sell it for US dollars. Today we have some countries selling it already for yen and ruble. So also you see the power of the US dollar is deteriorating more and more. So now let's, took, let's take a look what this means to the global financial order. So Article 1 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And then we have something like a global regulatory scheme made from nation states, mostly it's unelected people in these organizations, but they decide who is allowed to spend money or to own money or not. And um, the result is that we have 1.7 billion, and I think in, in real life there it's more people because these are the household um, heads, heads of the households. Um, so it's around two or three billion people who are unbanked, and most of them are also women. Another problem from, uh, resulting from these uh, regulations are, for instance, capital controls and sanctions that are put on nation states. But in real life, the poor people or the people, the, the general population is suffering, not the elites. They, they work it out in a way. And banks are broken. So in Africa, it's not easy to use a bank. It's first very costly. They have higher fees than we have. Um, it's not possible to send from every African country to another. I have a friend in Zimbabwe, and she told me, it's the first time that I can pay my freelancer in Kenya directly, and I did it with Bitcoin. I could never do that with the banking system. Then there is, of course, understandingly, a general mistrust in banks. And um, high fees, I said that already. So another example of what is not equality in my sense. There's uh, 14 African countries, that's about 200 million people in Africa, who still need to use the West African front or the Central African front. That means the front is packed to the euro, and what I think is the worst, they have to deposit half of their foreign exchanges with the French treasury. So that's not what I call independence, that's what I call monetary colonialism. And how does Bitcoin fix this? I guess you all know. It fixes it because everyone is treated the same, and Bitcoin is a neutral global borderless money. You can't exclude anyone, and that's good. Then the right to privacy. To be honest, I didn't know that this is actually an article in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence. So, but what is the reality? 
in reality, a few months ago, we had the general manager of the Bank of International Settlement saying in regards to CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, at the moment, we don't know who's using a $100 bill today. Yeah, that's the great thing about cash. But the key difference with the CBDC is the central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that expression of central bank liability. And also we will have the technology to enforce that. Privacy, buy. So I hear many people then tell me, yeah, but I've got nothing to hide, so I don't care. It's okay if they know everything I do. So the thing is, it's really not about that you don't have anything to hide. It's about the fact that your political opponent, or maybe you're gay or lesbian or something like that, and in some countries this is still illegal, they can make a case out of it against you. And that's the reason why privacy is so important. And it's also important to support uh, human rights activists and people who fight for freedom for other people and uh, who are endangered if their privacy was leaked. And I mean, it's even not easy here in our country. So actually, you have to pay money. You have to know you can use a VPN, for instance. That costs a little bit of money. But people in the global south, they don't even have the money to pay for that. Most of them, sadly, use WhatsApp. And they think WhatsApp and Facebook is the internet. So privacy is actually luxury in a way. And I think Bitcoin fixes this. Because it's pseudonymous, and if you use it the right way, right way it gives you enough uh, plausible deniability to still stay so private that nobody can harm you. And I believe and I hope that Bitcoin developers and on other layers like layer 2 or layer 3, um, new methods of using Bitcoin will become even more private. Next big problem is inflation. So now it's the first time that in Europe, for a hundred years ago, I mean, we also had hyperinflation, but everybody has forgotten because everybody is dead. Um, so <laughs> in Austria, we have like now 10% inflation, yeah? And energy prices are going like that. And, but still, Zimbabwe is the number one country. Uh, in July, they had 500% inflation. In Cuba, 135, Turkey 132, Sri Lanka 100, Lebanon 90, and so the list goes on. Interestingly enough, Venezuela is only at, only at 67%. Um, and so this is, of course, a big problem because you can't save money in your local currency. I mean, the Zimbabwean dollar is a joke currency, basically, and everybody knows that. People know that. That's from a Zimbabwean art article. And the reason for all that inflation in uh, Zimbabwe is definitely excessive money printing, we know that, and looting. So the elites are totally corrupt and loot all the, the money from, from the people. Yeah, how does Bitcoin fix this? 21 million cannot be inflated. And this is also, when I say that to people in my talks there, they understand that immediately. It's uh, quite different to hear where people say, ah, oh, why, why do we need Bitcoin? Hmm. They understand immediately. And speaking of corruption, ruling elites behind Zimbabwe's disappearing gold. Every year, uh, gold worth 1.5 billion is being looted by the elites. And then people wonder why there are no uh, good hospitals and things like that. Or ministers buy themselves new Range Rovers, but they don't um, fix the potholes on the streets. So that's why they need Range Rovers. How does Bitcoin fight corruption? Blockchain is a transparent ledger. If you have a budget or a project, you, you can also audit the, the government. You can audit it. Yeah, very important article. The freedom of speech. And what does this have to do with Bitcoin? Yeah, in many of these countries, you are not free to say your opinion. So, for instance, when I do interviews in Zimbabwe, I always ask, um, what, what shall I not ask? What is okay? What's not okay? And everybody tells me, please don't ask anything about the government. So, people in Zimbabwe, for instance, they are beaten dead because they are uh, members of the opposition and the guy on the right he is in jail now because he's wearing a yellow t-shirt 
because a few weeks ago, the Zimbabwean government forbade the yellow color because it's the color of the opposition. So <laughs> that's why Bitcoin is important because um, spending money is an expression of your opinion. If I support a political party, I express my opinion. And that's why it's important that we can use Bitcoin as this tool. Bitcoin transactions are uncensorable. And as I said before, it gives you enough privacy if you use it the right way. Hand in hand with freedom of speech goes freedom of association. Because if you can't express your political opinion, if you can't meet up with your fellow demonstrators or freedom fighters, um, then you basically have no political power anymore. And here I have an example from Nigeria in 2019, I think, 2020. There were the NSAS um, demonstrations against police brutality. And the feminist coalition of Nigeria started to collect donations to support the demonstrators, like with food and drinks and things like that. And then the central bank of Nigeria cut off their banking account. And they remembered, hey, there's something like Bitcoin. Uh, we spoke about that. And then they started to set up, they set up a BTC pay server and could get donations again and support the demonstrators. So Bitcoin's privacy and uncensorability enables people to cooperate against dictatorships. Freedom from discrimination. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political, etc. So in many of these countries, you have limits of the amount of money you are allowed to use. So they enforce it, basically. In Zimbabwe, the, the online banking tool, the centralized online, it's from the state, um, uh, limits uh, your transactions in a month to, at that time, $600. And a day, you are allowed to send $37. That might be much for people generally in, in, in Zimbabwe, but those mostly don't have bank accounts anyhow. But uh, I mean, imagine you wanna, uh, you have a business. I mean, how, how do you wanna work, you know? And also, as an example, in 2016, the Indian Central Bank and the Indian government, from one day to the other, they said the 500 and the 1,000 rupee notes are not valid anymore. And the people there had two or three days to exchange the money on the bank if they had a bank account. But the thing was, it was a weekend. So the result was, and the reason for this, that what the Indian government says was to find money laundering and black money. The result was that 82 people died and millions of people didn't have any money anymore because most of them work in the informal sector. So they had their stash of money at home and it was worthless from one day to the other. And the effect on the black money problem, it hasn't gone away. It didn't have any effect at all. And so freedom from discrimination, you all know, Bitcoin is permissionless. Anyone can use it regardless of age, wealth, gender, whatever. And even more important, not more important, equally important, nobody can take it away from you. Then the right to free movement goes also hand in hand with that. It's actually also a part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So you might, might have the right to free movement, but usually you can't take your money with you. And even more, if you have to flee a country, you need to be fast. You can't go to the ATM, uh, which might be closed already. But you can take your Bitcoin even in your head. You don't even need a smartphone or a USB stick if, you're <laughs> if, you're, if your mind is so clear to remember 12 or 24 words in the right um, order. Then you can move over um, borders um, with all your money in your head. So take your money with you. Bitcoin is borderless. And that's how it enforces the right to free movement, the right to own property, so many rights that Bitcoin enforces. Um, 75 economies still um, limit women's right to manage assets. There are countries in which women are not allowed to own property or to inherit. 
So they never can have some sort of land that could be a security to get a credit or to, to uh, get a bank account um, to support their businesses, their informal businesses. And it's mostly in the Middle East and North Africa, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in East Asia and Pacific. And guess what? People allows that. So anyone can use Bitcoin secretly and you can use it as a collateral for microloans in the future and I hope in the very near future. So that people in these countries who don't have money, they can save $1 a month on the Lightning Network, for instance. And when they have $10, they might get a microloan for $50 or something like that. And that is really uh, empowering for many, many small businesses. So this um, quote is from Daniel Erickson, the CEO of Transparency International, which is fighting corruption. And he says, in authoritarian contexts where control rests with a few, social movements are the last remaining check in power. It is the collective power held by ordinary people from all the walks of life that will ultimately deliver accountability. Sounds like Bitcoin, huh? Um, for me, Bitcoin is exactly that tool. It's a checks on power uh, for governments and also enables people um, to, to, to be become more free. So by, use, by using Bitcoin, I mean, it sounds not logical, but by just using Bitcoin here, you support freedom fighters globally and help the world uh, to make it more fair. And that's also why my initiative is called Bitcoin for Fairness, because I believe that that's the single most important argument for for Bitcoin. I mean, there are many important arguments, but I see it as some sort of historical reparation to, to make the wealth split or divide between the gap between the rich north and the poor south a little bit smaller. I mean, Bitcoin is not the, it won't fix the, the, the general um, um, differences between rich and poor. There will always be people who have more money than the others, but it, it'll, it, even it, it just allows everyone the same chances in a way. So, and also why I'm speeding up, so I'm speeding up my work in, uh, in Africa and these countries is because I believe that with more peer-to-peer -peer use, people there use Bitcoin in peer-to-peer -peer groups, peer-to-peer, non-KYC. So I think the more and more and more and more people using it there will create facts for us here and, uh, are basically um, a tool to fight regulation. Yeah, so um, just a few pictures of where I have been and what we've done. Um, that's a picture of Bitcoin Ekasi in South Africa. And they are, these are the surfer kids. So Herman Vivier um, had a surf school and uh, he heard about Bitcoin Beach and thought, mm, I could do the same. And um, the children get free surfing uh, lessons um, because it educates them. And they also have every day some hours of school. They have their own teacher there. And they also learn how to use um, a lightning wallet and to, to receive and send payments. It's a circular economy in a township with 5,000 people. And it's interesting that in... Bitcoin Ikasi, also the first shop owner to accept Bitcoin in her shop was a woman like Mama Rosa in El Salvador. Right hand is uh, again Luzando. Luzando is the senior surf coach and he's also the senior Bitcoin coach. So he's the guy who goes around in the township and tries to convince the shop owners to accept Bitcoin. And the, all the coaches are paid in Bitcoin. So they are paid from the surf school go home to the township and spend their money there, daily. That's uh, Nosichle's shop, and now 10 of 17 shops are already accepting Bitcoin. And as I said, the children sometimes uh, get a little bit of extra money, you know, when they've done something good or something, and then they can buy a soft drink or something like that in the township. That was at the University of uh, Lusaka in Zambia. Some hardcore Bitcoiners uh, on that image. So I, I, I actually really met Bitcoin Maxis there. They were Maxis before I came. <laughs> and they were so happy that I did these events because then they met the first others. 
One guy from Zimbabwe was driving six hours by bus to come to my event. And he said to me, I'm from Bulawayo, and I think I'm the only one. <laughs> and then we found out, no, there are three or four already in Bulawayo too. And that's the, the great thing about doing that work, because basically it's also about connecting people and enabling them to do more um, in their own uh, way. And what I'm also very proud and want to say, uh, they are now the first Bitcoin miners in Zimbabwe. It's a small operation, but it's powered by solar. And I'm very happy to see that because the guy who is doing it, he also wants to use it as an educational uh, possibility to educate other people about mining. Because actually, I mean, it's, it's weird, but electricity is very cheap in Zimbabwe. I don't know why, but the problem is it's very unreliable. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, what's up next? I'm flying from here tomorrow to Zimbabwe and I'm doing meetups and workshops again. And I, we started a two-page brochure for meetups to hand it out there to explain why Bitcoin and how they can start using Bitcoin. Because most people come to a meetup, then you tell them, uh, go to this website, do this, and then they go home and do, they do nothing. Um, and then we have the idea to do decentralized Bitcoin podcasts in local language. So help podcasters to become podcasters in their language and also enable it value for value so that they can earn Satoshis um, directly. Yes, my book is uh, going to be released in Portuguese and in Italian. And um, so I also hope that at the end of the year, it's planned that I'm going to Brazil and then Ghana, Nigeria, and again, Bitcoin Ikazi. And yes, um, thank you very much.